It Follows is a 2014 horror film written and directed by David Robert Mitchell. The film tells the story of Jay, who has just contracted a kind of sexually transmitted demon that takes the form of anonymous human beings and follows her on foot at a steady pace wherever she goes. If the demon touches her, we're told she'll die. The film was well-reviewed by critics and has attracted a lot of attention from film scholars since its release, many noticing how the film's premise addresses and even challenges some of the conventions of the slasher subgenre. Most notably, the tendency for slasher films to kill off sexually active teens while rewarding the virginal final girl with survival. In this video, though, we're going to focus on another way that the film borrows and challenges the conventions of slasher horror films, primarily through its cinematography. Last time we talked about two cinematographic innovations of slasher films, killer POV and jump scares. Here we're going to show how It Follows borrows these techniques, but also subverts them. So let's think about the ways in which it appropriates slasher horror. How does it actually use the jump scare? Well, just to reinforce this notion of off-screen space and kind of including a space that we might be paranoid about being, say, uh, penetrated, think about this moment here when our protagonist is kind of examining herself. It's a very quiet moment, and we have this open space that indeed introduces a jump scare with the ball that hits the window, right? Uh, space is being penetrated from the left. Here's another simple example, though even more interesting. Um, space that is, say, beyond um, a barrier is broken so that we get um, a space that's along the z-axis. What about things like this. Think about how cliched almost these two sequences are in terms of their use of slasher horror scare tactics. Um, in a sequence like this one, a broken window in the kitchen. what we're getting is a kind of confined space in which yeah, our awareness of what lies around the corner is heightened and intensified. And the scare that happens in this sequence indeed is the result of what lies just around the frame, right? Things uh, happen in slow motion, we get these POV shots, and we get these corners, right? This is classic horror, and you should think of The Shining, right? This is how we began the class, with the idea that turning a corner has something horrific bound up in it. Um, and the shock here will happen just as our protagonist will realize that to her left, 90 degrees, is a, is a scare. Um, similarly, we'll get something like this in this sequence um, when all we have is this tiny little space and we're just waiting it for it to be filled by, by a monster. So these are fairly conventional appropriations of slasher horror. Um, the use of off-screen space, the use of confined spaces to create a kind of shock of spatial penetration. Um, so in many ways, I want to suggest that It Follows knows that it is a 80s era slasher film. It is uh, trying to hit on the popularity of 1980s era horror, which has to do with the slasher. I mean, just look at the way it advertised itself. This kind of retro illustrated poster art that's evocative of Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Friday the 13th. Um, look at how much individual shots and settings will match uh, that of Halloween, generally considered to be the most influential slasher film in the subgenre, right? You can even really think about not just setting, but shots, even lenses, the use of wide angle lenses, which is all over Halloween is also in It Follows, right? We'll look at this scene in a moment, the evocation of old horror film, the investigation of premarital sexuality, which we'll talk about later, which is essential to the horror film, especially its ideological components, and shots like this, right? So let's now think about what's similar, right? Uh, but also what's importantly different. And this is where I want to kind of push the discussion about It Follows, because it'll get us to understand what it is doing on a formal level. So consider this sequence from Halloween, in which our protagonist is in a classroom. But what Samuels is really talking about here is fate. You see, fate caught up with several lives here. No matter what course of action Collins took, he was destined to his own fate. His own day of reckoning with himself. The idea...
idea is that destiny is a very real, concrete thing that every person has to deal with. How does Samuel's view of fate differ from that of Costain? Lori? Ma'am? Answer the question. Oh, um, Costain wrote that fate was somehow related only to religion, whereas Samuel's felt that well, fate was like a natural element, like earth, air, fire, and water. That's right. Samuel's definitely personified fate. In Samuel's writing, fate is immovable, like a mountain. It stands where man passes. So I mostly want to show the sequence for how it resonates with the sequence from It Follows, but you can see a number of the flasher tropes happening here. The fact that the protagonist is almost preternaturally good at school. Hostein wrote that fate was somehow related only to religion. Um, generally, the protagonists, the female protagonists of slasher horror films are, are good students. Um, it kind of corresponds with their kind of abiding by social, social strictures and, stro and social norms. Um, also, the kind of heavy-handed invocation of the themes of fate um, and death that you'll get. The teacher and, of course, this idea that he can seemingly disappear, right? That he doesn't vanish per se, but he does so in a way that suggests his ability to simply pop up unannounced. Now let's check out a similar sequence in It Follows. Sleep so peacefully, smooth by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched out on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cut. So I want to suggest that even though this is very similar in structure to uh, the sequence from Halloween, a couple details actually announce the important formal differences that It Follows is going to lend to the history of slasher horror. The first of which, which seems kind of incidental to the scene, but I want to suggest is very important to what this film does, is this gesture of rotating the camera slowly around a wide expanse of space. There's something about this particular kind of camera move that is essential to what It Follows is doing. The idea that scanning space instead of say presenting a confined space is a different mode by which you can scare spectators um, and actually you can operate in a way that isn't quite confined to the logic of the jump scare and secondly the idea of getting this picture of of space with a lot of people and having to use your own eyes to pick out the villain right a little bit different from how we got in Halloween where we, where our monster was the only person in the center of the frame. Here it takes us a moment to realize that this person um, might not simply be um, an ordinary passerby. So I want to say that these kinds of sequences are part of a larger pattern of the film in which the film trains you to be paranoid of open spaces, right? Very different from the film training you to be paranoid of closed spaces that can be penetrated in a shocking jump scare way. So consider something like this. This is not the kind of shot that would be used in a slasher horror film to pique your fear. But the film at this point has trained you to scan these spaces for a potential threat just emerging. And in fact, I imagine a number of you we're watching the sequence and we're like, who is that? And of course the film will address it and make a little joke about it. Do you guys see that girl right there? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. About it. In a, in a similar way, there are even some moments that are not acknowledged that actually reward your vigilant spectatorship so you can kind of 
find a monster or a potential monster and ask the question, is that someone who might be uh, a monster following? Right? And the film will use, once again, cinematographic techniques to emphasize the fact that the threat comes from all directions. This 360 degree pan is the formal opposite of the jump scare. Instead of giving me a confined space that can be penetrated, it's giving me a view of the entire space. Asking me not to say wait in anticipation, but ask, actually asking me or encouraging me as a spectator to focus, to look vigilantly, to scan the space for a potential monster, to ask, is this person who is walking a threat? Or are they merely a person? That is the ordinary kind of banal distinction the film wants me to make. And of course, I met a number of you fixated on this particular person who's walking a little too straight, a little too close to the camera, right? But interestingly, the film is confident enough to just let it go, to include moments that don't scare us, but that ask us to imagine everything that is happening off screen, slowly encroaching upon our protagonist. It's a different kind of scare tactic. And it's one that I think is quite clever in its use of the inherent properties of film form, right? So think about these moments in the film where you get an emphasis on subjective point of view. Um, how often does our character simply just sit around, look, say, look up and look at the squirrels, look down at the water, look at her hand. This is a kind of, I mean, these sequences seem to be doing nothing, but they are establishing the luxury of a perception, of a mode of perception that is not vigilant and is not about self-preservation, but is simply luxuriating in the possibility of looking at the world around you. This becomes extremely important later in the film when it's taken away from her. Or this sequence, Right? An important sequence because it's the moment before she is, she's attacked. Right? The moment before she's chloroformed. It's a moment when she is indeed vulnerable, but she is comfortable, say, just allowing her perception to dwell on her hand at the ground. She's a whole world of danger behind her that she is not aware of. And that's the kind of the tragedy of the film, right? Um, if there is tragedy in a kind of horror film um, that kind of wants to wink at us, is of course that, that she is going to to lose this. We have this sequence where we are looking here, but also the film is going to give us this little gesture of our protagonist looking down at her hand, or at her leg rather, counting blades of grass. I don't want to say the blades of grass symbolize anything. I think that's important. I mean, you can maybe do that kind of work if there's something about it that piques your interest. But I do want to say that simply looking down and having these games of playing with your perception, little nonsense games that you do to pass the time, becomes a luxury in this film. And it answers the question, why include these close-ups, right? Jeff, they seem to, be, to fill no purpose, but they absolutely play with the, way, the perceptual game that the film is playing with us. So the death of inwardness, the idea that she has this tendency to kind of close her vision off from the world becomes a vigilant vision, vision, right? So consider the way that she inhabited the world earlier and then consider this moment when she first uh, is, is afflicted with, um, with the it monster. She goes to the center of an open space and we get each of these POV shots representing each kind of sector of, of 90 degrees so she can see all around her, right? She looks to her to her right, right? And then she'll get, we'll get a POV shot. It's a totally opposed way of portraying a character examining space. Um, and you'll get something like that here as well. She'll go to the same space of her pool where she earlier looked up at the squirrels, looked, at, looked down at her cast, um, but in this case, she has a paranoid vision. And this is an interesting moment because the film never tells us if there was something here, but it uses the concealment of the slats of the fence to play tricks on us. Are there, in fact, people um, lurking behind the fence? 
And uh, I want to finally uh, end this comparison with the slasher film uh, in the way that Adam Hart talks about it by looking at the endings of these films. Um, so this is the ending of Halloween. And I want you to think about that omnipresence of, fact, of the monster that Hart talks about. Right, so Hart will talk about the way in which slasher horror monsters, despite not being, say, portrayed representationally as invincible or as invisible, often get this treatment that makes them seem as if you can't pin them down within the frame. So it's important that Halloween, the kind of film to really entrench most of the conventions that were adopted later, ends with these series of empty shots that remind us that we have not pinned down the monster and that he is ever present by this idea of this breathing sound um, that is that is like part of the film and not not locatable in space. And I want to suggest that the ending of It Follows, of course, which also has this open-ended question, is it over? Um, a very 1980s slasher kind of ending, um, is doing something similar, though, albeit not the same, right? Um, and that It Follows, if it's doing something distinct, is really getting at this uh, idea um, that the ordinary image, right, that the monster is, some, is something that is indistinguishable from what it just means to be out in public space, to say, walk around and see strangers walking around with you. Instead of having the monster be distinguished as a, say, you know, a tall masked figure, figure with a knife in their hand, this image becomes a haunting one, even though out of the context of the film, it would be a simple, ordinary idea of two figures and someone who may be just passing by. I think this is the kind of horror film that when you walk home after you watch it in the theater and you see people, say, coming towards you or, or walking behind you, it gives you that twinge of paranoia. I think this is one of the interesting things about um, this film and, and how it uses scare tactics that are quite different from the slasher horror film. Okay, so next time we are going to talk about gender and spectatorship for next week's unit, but we'll return to this film to ask some of those questions that are relevant to, to the issues of, of gender and spectatorship and sexuality, uh, which are all over the um, narrative of the film. Okay, so we'll see you next time.